As always, the opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of DKI APCSS, the U.S. Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Because of the confidence that Kim Jong-un has gained um, domestically, you know, um, it claims to have um, improved the economy in 2023. Um, and uh, it survived the international sanctions, the self-isolation. So I think the self-confidence that Kim Jong-un has gained from, from those developments domestically and also um, the confidence he has gained from his summits with Putin, um, the improving relationship with Russia, will um, likely keep Kim Jong-un on this path um, that he's currently on, which is not toward reform, but away from reform. From the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii, welcome to another episode of the Security Nexus webinar, where we explore the most pressing security challenges and geopolitical shifts shaping our world today. I'm your host, James Minnick, Colonel United States Army retired and professor here at DKIA PCSS. It's a pleasure to have you with us for this insightful conversation in episode 24, North Korea-Russia Alliance, Economic and Geopolitical Implications. The relationship between North Korea and Russia has taken a significant leap forward recently. In mid-June, we witnessed a historic moment as Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un signed a mutual defense treaty. This move, coinciding with Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine and escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula, has heightened concerns among the U.S. and its allies and signals a new era of strategic partnership between these two nations. North Korea, long striving for self-reliance amidst international sanctions and isolation, sees a potential lifeline in its growing relationship with Russia. It's a chance to diversify its partnerships, secure much needed economic support and technological exchange, and perhaps even gain a stronger foothold on the global stage. On the other hand, Russia, a global power with ambitions in the Asia Pacific, views North Korea as a strategic asset, offering an opportunity to expand its influence, counterbalance Western pressure, and potentially gain access to valuable resources and military cooperation. The implications of this burgeoning alliance are vast and multifaceted. It could reshape the balance of power in Northeast Asia, influencing the strategies of major players like the United States, South Korea, and Japan. It raises questions about the effectiveness of international sanctions and the potential for new diplomatic avenues. And crucially, it has the potential to impact the lives of millions of North Koreans who have long endured economic hardship. Today, we'll unravel the complexities of this evolving partnership, exploring its economic, political, and humanitarian dimensions. We'll examine the potential benefits and risks for North Korea and Russia, explore the potential impacts on regional and global stability, and consider the human costs of these geopolitical maneuvers. Guiding us through this intricate landscape is Rachel Min Young Lee, a senior fellow at the Stimson Center's Korea program in 38 North. Rachel's deep expertise on North Korea and its regional relationships will be invaluable as we navigate this critical issue. Rachel, welcome to Hawaii and to our program. Thank you very much for having me. Very happy to be here. Oh, we are, we've been looking forward to this and I'm excited to sit down and have this discussion with you on this, to me, a really important topic. Mm -hmm. By practice, I like to invite our guests to share their journey. And so maybe you'll tell us your story. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is how I became a North Korea expert mm. or analyst. <laughs> I still get a, a little embarrassed when I use the word expert mm. myself. Um, and when people ask me that question, I like to tell them that North Korea found me than the other way around. I just stumbled into it. So? chance. Um, so... There was a job vacancy announcement looking for an editor, um, an English editor, and I thought that was what I was applying for. And um, I mean, it, indeed, the job turned out to be editing, but uh, I uh, it was an office that watched um, North Korea. And um, I just became, over the years, um, just 
became an expert, I guess, um, started to, I started by um, collecting information and mm -hmm. then um, I was trained to become an analyst. So it was quite a, quite a journey um, over 19 years um, from 2000 to 2019. Mm. Now you focus in the field of economics, is that right? Um, actually, I was trained to do propaganda analysis. Oh, same one. So propaganda analysis, looking at um, really a broad range of issues. Um, I would say everything with the exception of uh, WMD mm. and um, science and technology. So leadership, domestic politics, um, economic issues, inter-Korean uh, foreign policy issues. In my early years on the peninsula, um, I was, so 1982, I was up at the fire base. So we had artillery fire base up in the DMZ and we used to have balloons come over and drop propaganda. Uh, and they, they went both directions. Now, people who are following what's happening on the Korean peninsula today would note a bit of a, you know, a resurgence of that. And it's quite different in the way things mm -hmm. are happening. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe that was an early exposure I had to propaganda. You must have seen some of those. I, I, I did. Uh, we call those uh, gray lit. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we had colleagues uh, who lived on, you know, um, in, in Yongsan. Um, sometimes they would pick it up and <laughs> yeah, no, it did bring, come bring it to the office yeah, or, yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, the, the th what I was trained to do was really um, to read North Korean state media, okay. um, like the Party Daily, the Cabinet Daily, um, um, watch North Korean TV, listen to the radio. Um, so really open source. It's fascinating. Um, yeah. And collecting that information and then processing it and then analyzing. That's a deep, that's a depth of, uh, of experience that I think few have. So <laughs> this is going to be a fascinating discussion. Let's, let's turn a little bit. Let's talk about shifting alliances. North Korea's foreign policy. I mean, it's evolving. Mm -hmm. Leader Kim Jong-un is now engaging with China and Russia. Mm. And we say, say now, I mean, since 18, there's been uh, levels of engagement. In, and as I indicated, we j just in June, mid-June, uh, sat down uh, in a summit, another summit with, uh, with Putin. So this is an evolution. Um, so here's the question. What political and economic factors are driving these diplomatic overtures? Um, so I think we do have to go back to post Hanoi okay. uh, in early 2019. Um, so after the Hanoi summit, I think Pyongyang's view of the U.S. shifted. Yes. Kim Jong-un's thinking on the U.S. shifted. And you can see this by tracking his public comments about, um, about the U.S. And I think probably the most telling um, remark that he made in his public speeches was when he said, that um, North Korea was in a long-term confrontation with the U.S. Didn't matter who was the president. The U.S. is always going to pick a fight, always going to look for something um, to, to quarrel with us. So that he made that comment for the first time in a December 2019 party plenary meeting that was only, what, nine months, 10 months after the Hanoi summit. And I think that was really um, what lies at the bottom, you know, um, of all of this that we're seeing. Um, North Korea's shifting, um, I guess, maybe view mm. of the U.S. Um, domestically, I, I, just just Kim Jong Un's experience um, with the U.S. You know, he sat down for two rounds of summit talks with Trump, um, and then there was an informal um, talk in Panmunjom in, in July 2019. Um, nothing came out of those uh, meetings um, and summits. And so I think Kim Jong-un learned the hard way that really there was nothing that North Korea was willing to do that would change U.S. policy or what, in, to use to borrow their words, U.S. hostile policy toward the DPRK. Um, and then so that was Kim Jong Un's sort of experience, mm -hmm. you know, with his, uh, with his, um, through his meetings um, with the with this, with the U.S. president. Externally, I think North Korea started to realize that um, the geopolitical landscape was working um, in its favor. Uh, you know, we talk about U.S. China strategic competition a lot, so the divide between the U.S. and China 
um, and also um, with Russia, right? Um, and I think uh, the, the war in Ukraine really was a turning point. And we see, we can see how North Korea just basically really galloped um, toward Russia since the war in Ukraine. You know, uh, North Korea started pivoting to China, but it was very gradual, you know, in stages going back to June 2019 when Xi Jinping made a state visit to Pyongyang. But with Russia, it was like, it was like a, just, just galloping towards uh, Russia, you know, just very, very, very decisive and very quick. Um, which was surprising because, I mean, we had seen indications of North Korea pivoting back to China and Russia, um, but it was just the speed and the decisiveness of, of uh, with which it did, did that um, was, was quite amazing. Um, but I would say really the centerpiece of um, North Korea's foreign policy uh, for 30 plus years, going back to the 1990s, really was... Um, normalizing relations with DC, with, with Washington, uh, by working toward denuclearization yeah. and uh, moving away from China and, and Russia. So non-alignment with China and Russia. And because that centerpiece of their foreign policy, uh, working toward normalization relations with the US, because that changed, and that was a fundamental shift, uh, I think their natural recourse um, was to pivot back to China and Russia. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the geopolitical landscape, I think, um, played a decisive role in North Korea's decision to pivot back to those uh, two giant uh, neighbors that they uh, tried to move away from. Um, and of course, I think the other decisive factor in North Korea's thinking um, about, um, you know, the, the world, the geopolitical order, was how it perceived U.S. leadership on the global stage. Um, I think what it saw was declining US leadership and power um, on the global stage. I think North Korea was keeping a very close eye on what was happening in, in, in Afghanistan, you know, the pull, the pull out, how that happened. Um, and of course, again, um, the strategic competition with the US, um, China. Um, so I think all of that was taken into account as well. And you can see this by um, tracking again, Kim Jong-un's uh, public statements. Uh, for the first time in public uh, in September 2021, I believe, um, in a speech to the Supreme People's Assembly, which is North Korea's parliament, um, he for the first time mentioned um, multipolar world, um, a new Cold War. Um, so you can tell, you know, where that, where they were, um, you know, some of the drivers of, um, of really what shaped North Korea's thinking. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, I have tracked this issue for a long time. And, you, and in 94, with, in October 94, when they agreed, the uh, framework was signed. Many mm -hmm. people probably not real, realize, but one of the four major tenets was normalizing economic and political relations with mm -hmm. the United States, as was uh, the 2005 uh, statement uh, that uh, from the six-party talks. Or even when uh, Kim Jong-un came to power after his father died in December of 2011, we had the Leap Day deal just two months later that he felt secure enough in his position as a new leader to be able to engage with the United States mm -hmm. in February of uh, 12. Mm -hmm. um, no, thanks for pulling on that, because I, I think there's a lot of context to be held uh, over this period of time mm -hmm. to uh, to make sense of, of where we find ourselves today. I want to pull a little bit more, though. You, you spoke about uh, its relations with China and how it had been growing there. Let's, we'll start there before we go into uh, more about Russia, but China's economic embrace. I mean, North Korea's dependency on China, it has grown significantly since the imposition of UN sanctions after the first nuclear test in October of 2006, mm -hmm. right? So here's a question. How has the reliance evolved recently mm -hmm. and what potential economic consequences might arise from North Korea's diversifying partnership? That is an interesting question. Um, and, you know, you're right. North Korea's uh, dependence on China has grown astronomically. I mean, North Korea's trade with China is accounts for 98.3% of North Korea's entire trade volume. <laughs> so with the rest of the world, it's what, 1.7%, right? Um, so we're talking about North Korea basically 
just being almost completely independent, uh, dependent on China. It has not always been this way either, because I mentioned in 2006, it was only like 38% relation, right. uh, percentage with China. So mm -hmm. those who may not track this. So it has not always been this almost 100%. So no. say more. And, you know, I think it is important to note on, on that note, you know, talking about almost or near complete uh, dependence on China um, economically. Kim Jong-un is very much aware of this. And you can tell because during the border lockdown um, to prevent or manage um, COVID um, outbreaks, um, you know, there was a major national campaign um, for recycling and for local production. And I think, of course, there are many facets to that, you know, many multiple reasons as to why he launched that campaign. But I think one major driver was to try to bring down North Korea's over-reliance on China yes. economically. Um, so you can tell that there is that leadership um, awareness um, of the, the risks involved um, in being overly reliant on one country. In terms of the potential implications of North Korea's diversifying um, partnerships um, for North Korea's relationship with, uh, with China, I think there is some debate among scholars about um, the potential implications, um, and partly because we have yet to see how those implications play out, mm. uh, because North Korea is it's still in the stages of diversifying, starting with Russia, and we're starting to see more exchange between the North Koreans and the Belarusians. Um, so we're still in the beginning stages. We have yet to um, yet to know for sure what the implications would be. But um, so far, um, I think the over, I, I think the um, most experts are in agreement that um, even with North Korea's deepening and expanding relationship with Russia, it'll be extremely difficult for Russia to replace China. Oh. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, ninety-eight three point three percent is not. <laughs> yeah, I think not an easy number to work with. <laughs> no, I mean, and maybe you can say more, but it feels. Let's let's go there now. I mean, let's just ask about the. You know, what specific economic gains then do you see that North Korea is trying to get from Russia? Because this is quite different between what they get from China. Right. And then. Uh, well, yeah. So we'll start with the easy ones. Okay. Um, the uh, the wheat, right? Crude oil, uh, refined petroleum products um, are what North Korea could gain immediately. And in fact, I think we have seen multiple reports um, saying that Russia has been shipping um, those products that I just mentioned. And so that's the most obvious um, benefit that North Korea um, would seek from the Russians. Um, I think there has been some media reports about, uh, there have been some media reports about North and uh, Russia uh, releasing or uh, releasing $9 million um, out of what some $30 million that are um, um, of, of frozen assets. Um, in a Russian financial institution. Mm. So that's, again, um, something that North Korea, um, that's a benefit for North Korea by cultivating uh, relations with the Russians. Um, and of course, the whatever North Korea is gaining um, from Russia, from the, uh, the weapons exports. Um, and of course, we all know that Russia needs uh, manpower. Um, yeah. So, you know, construction workers, for example. Um, so... North Korea has manpower that it can export. Again, that's um, potentially cash or several thousand have worked in uh, in Russia, in, in Siberia. Yeah. You know, you have the lumberjacks, um, and now with the war, you know, the construction workers, um, they're much, they're very much um, in demand. And um, also, and this is one that not many people talk about uh, just yet. Uh, on the eve of his visit to Pyongyang in June. Well, just just two months ago, yeah. um, Putin contributed a an article um, to the Party Daily, uh, mm. Shinbun, the North Korean Party Daily, where he said um, where he was talking about the significance of his visit, um, the relationship between the North Koreans and the Russians. He said um, that North Korea and Russia would forge a mutual payment system, and it's hard to know exactly what he meant by that, but. Um, perhaps it's something about the. Um, perhaps he was referring to the, um, the the ruble payment system. Okay. Um, I think uh, Ru that Russia has been forging agreements with different countries 
um, where they can deal in their respective national currencies. Um, so it sounds like that's maybe what the two countries are going for, um, North Korea and Russia. And of course, you know, the effect that would have, um, you know, for North Korea, however big or small, is that, um, you know, they can bypass the, the, the international payment system. And, and, you know, one of the reasons why North Korea wants, wanted to improve relations with the U.S. is um, so that North Korea can be incorporated into the international financial system yes. um, because it's cut off from that, right? Um, but if, again, how much that would actually help the North Korean economy hmm. um, is yet to be seen. But, but I think the, the important thing is this. There are opportunities, more opportunities uh, for Kim Jong-un, more options for him. Whether how feasible those options and opportunities may be, um, you know, in the end, we don't know. And he himself probably doesn't know. But I think what is important is that Kim Jong-un has more options than he did before. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Uh, the old adage, not to lay your ladder on the ground. Uh, and so he has uh, tried to, or don't close your own doors, you know, mm -hmm. see seek opportunities where they may come. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I think uh, uh, given the world situ global situation, what's going on in uh, Ukraine, he has found another option to uh, for outlets. And as you were alluding to, uh, there has been significant transfer of, of Soviet era munitions. Uh, 152 millimeter mm -hmm. has gone over in millions. Uh, some of that probably uh, maybe in cash, but some of it in kind. Uh, I think I, I saw a report recently about a uh, number of horses coming. Uh, maybe that was part of the barter I, trade. I suspect that and a whole lot of other things. There's probably a trade of things happening and maybe not a lot of cash. Right. And much more uh, in payment in kind. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are options that didn't exist uh, yeah. to, you mm -hmm. know, some, some time ago. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit more about Russia, yeah. DPRK, and oh, China? Do so. um, an interesting question in my mind these days is, you know, we talk a lot about the cooling down of relations between Beijing and Pyongyang these yeah. days. Like, that's been reported widely, right? Um, how the two countries have grown apart um, in the last year or so. This is a calculated risk. Mm that Kim Jong-un made, hmm. um, that, that he has taken. Yeah. And there has to be something in North Korea's relationship with Russia that is enough to offset what Pyongyang would have gotten by forging closer ties with Beijing. And, you know, I do, this is like an open-ended question, it's like a rhetorical question, but, you know, I think that is important to keep in mind. And again, we go back to something that I talked about earlier, which is options. You know, what options and opportunities does Kim Jong-un see? You know, especially given the fact that 98.3% of North Korea's entire trade volume, I mean, that, 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 that's with China, right? Joseph Nye once said, uh, security is like oxygen. You tend not to think of it until it begins to disappear, and then you can think of nothing else. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, mm -hmm. listening to you, how much of this is uh, calculated mm -hmm. on hard security issues uh -huh. because the relationship with, with Russia seems to be much more tightly knit in those security areas. And it was much broader economic areas with China. Mm -hmm. And there must be though I, transfers of technology and, and capabilities uh, with Russia in, mm. in the defense area. And I think we're I think we're gonna see some of that. Maybe we're seeing some of it and don't recognize it now, but it was only a year ago when uh, uh, Defense Minister Shoigu came down to uh, Pyongyang, right? Which uh, was shocking. Wasn't it? To me. Yeah. It was shocking to a whole lot of people. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, um, that anniversary, 727, right. which North Korea calls the War Victory Day. Yes, right? the, the day the armistice was uh, the, the signed armistice, in 1953. Right. So that's, that's right. the armistice day uh, for, for all of us. But in North Korea, it's called the um, the Fatherland's um, Victory, um, the Day of the Fatherland's Victory, right. the War war Victory. Yes. Um, that anniversary was not celebrated with the Russians. Mm. 
you know, just because of the way um, the, you know, the, the Soviets uh, role or lack of a role <laughs> in the Korean War. You know, um, the war began with uh, Stalin basically giving a green light to Kim Il-sung, but, um, you know, they never really followed through in the way that Kim Il-sung had expected. It was really, at the end of the day, the Chinese and the Chinese people's volunteers, the CPV, that saved the day for yeah. North Korea. So that anniversary was not celebrated with the Russians, mm. at least not in modern history. Yeah. Um, and so to see a high-ranking Russian official coming to Pyongyang uh, to watch a military parade and, and of all high-ranking Russian officials, defense, defense minister. minister, I mean, I think that was so symbolic in so many ways. Yeah. And, and which tells me that, or which kind of, implies that perhaps something was already going amiss like between the rush uh, between the chinese, chinese and the north koreans um already back then in in the summer of 2023 no well said and interesting mm -hmm. If it's okay, I think I'm going to pull this uh, conversation Oops. this year some other things of uh, you know the UN panel of experts mm -hmm. uh re was uh um, I mean, it was dissolved that it was in April of, of this year. And that had been instituted after Resolution 1718 uh, back in 2006, after mm -hmm. the, the first uh, um, nuclear test. And so with that now gone, I mean, here's the question. What is the current state of sanctions and how might Russia, its involvement, affect the impact of those? Well, um, I think... We can say that since North Korea started improving relations with China and, and Russia, uh, the enforcement of sanctions has really been weakened, right? Yeah. And I think that's been reported widely, yeah. um, including um, by the UN panel of experts um, and, and their reports. Um, I think, and this is not to say that sanctions are unnecessary because they're not being imposed in the way that they were designed to uh, be imposed. But, you know, they are certainly not, um, they're, 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 they're not, um, they're not, they're not really in, in um, be, being enforced no, they're not. Um, at all. I mean, when you have China and Russia watching North Korea's back um, and you hear constantly about these illegal transshipments and, you know, all sorts of creative ways by which North Korea has been smuggling, you know, um, things in and out of um, the country that, um, that are, banned under the UN, you know, as per UN sanctions, um, you know, which of course is one of the reasons why I think um, North Korea and the North Korean economy has survived despite the years of um, international sanctions being imposed, um, nominally <laughs> at least. And um, despite some experts speculation at the outset of North Korea's um, closing of borders um, in early 2020, that uh, North Korea was not going to survive um, in, in an isolated state as that. Um, so, again, this is not to say that sanctions are unnecessary because they're not being imposed, but um, I think it does speak to the fact that they are not, they have not been implemented effect effectively. And I think going forward, um, it's just going to get worse because Putin has, you know, he said when, when he was in Pyongyang that he was against illegal um, unilateral, what did, what was the word he, what was his wording? Illegal unilateral enforcement of uh, rules. And, and by that, he meant sanctions. Um, he, was pretty, um, he was pretty direct about that. Having been sanctioned uh, and they're in the same themselves. Boat. <laughs> and they're in the um, same boat. <laughs> yeah, they have zero impetus to, uh, yeah. to, to sanction. And, and, and the relationship, the strengthening relationship with North Korea, North Korea providing mm -hmm. uh, significant amounts mm -hmm. of weaponry. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the observant uh, person could have seen this coming. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think there was some hope in the lead up to the vote um, on, you know, extending the mandate for the UN panel of experts uh, in, in March that Russia would still or, or might do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting also, if you look at the, um, the, the, the result of the vote, that the Chinese abstained yes, did. and the Russians uh, vetoed. And, and I think, again, that that is such a it's a good um, snapshot of, you know, how, 
you know, how, wh why North Korea pivoted yes. more closely, um, you know, Russia. Um, they went out all, all the way to veto, whereas the Chinese abstained, right? So um, kind of well, trying to do the right thing, you know? Um, so, you know, from Kim Jong-un's point of view, who's more reliant? I mean, who's more reliable? Um, who's a more reliable partner, Putin or Xi Jinping? It's Putin. Well, uh, <laughs> and, and they have now just signed, uh, as, I, as I talked about in the open, mm -hmm. I mean, they signed the uh, treaty for comprehensive security. Uh, yes. um, and that is significant. It's a, similar, akin to uh, the 1961 treaty. Uh, and it has clauses in there that provides for collective defense. It provides for economic... Uh, um, engagement for science and tech exchanges. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is fairly significant. Say more. What would you say? Um, I think so. I think we knew um, that a treaty was coming down the pike um, because of North Korea media's readout of uh, the foreign minister Cha Son Hee's uh, visit to Moscow um, right. in in January 2024, and okay. in the readout of her uh, the outcome of her visit to uh, to Russia. It said that uh, the two countries had agreed to put um, the relationship on a legal on a new legal framework. Um, so that could have only meant a treaty. So we knew that they were working um, that they had been working on a new treaty. And you know there are concerning clauses just you know throughout the document. Um, and I don't want to necessarily exaggerate or like overplay. Um, or it, like be an alarmist, right? About the uh, the the treaty, it's concerning, um, mm -hmm. definitely. But at the same time, I think we have to remember that uh, we have yet to see how the treaty is actually implemented. Right? right? Yeah. So obviously, you know, if you look at um, Article Three, you know, they talk about uh, consulting one another if there are um, if one party is um, on the cusp of, uh, cusp of being attacked. You know, in Article Four. Um, it, the most uh, one of the most talked about um, articles is uh, where they talk about uh, what if one party comes under um, armed aggression, yes. you know the other um, country um, will uh, will help, um, you know. But but of course there is that caveat um, according to the uh, domestic laws and uh, the um, Article Fifty One of, of of the UN Charter. So th there is that caveat, um, you know. So giving each country some wiggle room, um, so as not to become automatically True. involved. Um, and I think Article 8 also talks about, <clears throat> alludes to forming some kind of a security arrangement that smacks to me of um, uh, the U.S., ROK, Japan, you know, trilateral security uh, cooperation arrangement. It's also a year old. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, um, the there are articles um, about economic uh, cooperation, you know, just very broad range, um, ranging from trade and investment to um, customs. Um, again, we have yet to see how any of this is implemented, but I think we can say this, that again, Kim Jong-un probably sees a lot more options than he did even a year ago. And it definitely leaves more room for Russian involvement in the region. It does. Yeah. I think if for some perspective as well, the uh, the 1961 uh, um, treaty mm -hmm. lasted for decades, I think till 96, and never once did they uh, um, come to the defense of another mm -hmm. side. And, and in the late 60s, you know, we had what we would refer to as the Second Korean War, where there was quite a bit of fighting going on in the DMZ, even in 68, the attack at the Blue House. And so none of those things triggered no. even then uh, any type of uh, mutual defense. That's that's a very good, um, that's a very good point. Yes. Mm. And, and the other thing too about the treaty, this treaty is, you know, you enter into a treaty with a, and this is another question that comes up a lot, right? When we talk about North Korea, Russia relations is, um, is this relationship strategic and long-term or is this short-term tactical? Um, the, so a treat, you enter into a treaty, I think, with a strategic intent. Oh, uh, one would right? think. One would yep. think. Um, but, you know, it's like a living document and it's, um, you know, it changes. Yes. Like it, it goes with the flow of, you know, geopolitics, yes. you know, the relationship between the two countries. 
So if we think about the, um, the 1961 treaty um, between the Soviet Union and the DPRK, forged, I, I believe, in uh, July 1961, um, little did Kim Il-sung know that in October 1962, there would be the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, which really, um, you know, uh, raised a red flag for, for Kim Il-sung and, you know, raised questions, a lot of questions in his mind about whether the Soviets were reliable, you know, which then induced him to um, embark on a long journey of uh, prioritizing defense over the civilian economy. Um, so, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later, but yeah, it's, um, you just don't know. Even Kim Il-sung, even Kim, not Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un and Putin, um, I believe, uh, I'm not a Russia expert, um, but definitely from, uh, from North Korea's point of view, the treaty was entered into with a strategic intent. But, um, you know, I think the North Koreans are also smart enough to know that it's not like a, you know, forever, you know, um, nothing can change the nature of this relationship, right? I mean, I think they're aware of that. Yeah, no, well said. Let's talk uh, about mm -hmm. human the human toll of all of this right now. Mm -hmm. So the economic hardship mm -hmm. has had profound impact on the North Korean people. How does the current economic situation affect the lives of ordinary North Koreans? And how might a closer relationship with Russia affect their well-being? You know, when we talk about the North Korean economy, um, it's it's really hard to gauge exactly how difficult the situation is. We can only surmise um, based on, um, you know, testimonials, you know, the defector testimonials, the um, the different uh, data that we're seeing, um, you know, the economic indices from, um, you know, not from North Korea, but... Um, you know, the, there are different ways of deriving, um, you know, economic, um, North Korean economic, economic indices. So, you know, the, um, and then, of course, you know, there are um, organizations that track uh, market prices like grain prices, you know, um, the exchange rate current uh, fluctuations. So all of those things come together. And then, of course, um, you have North Korean state media uh, where you can get some indication of how difficult or not so difficult the situation may be. And I think overall, it is fair to say that um, the situation is very, um, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. Um, I think we can say that um, economic hardship for sure um, is there. But I do want to sort of, you know, to be, you know, we, we, we should acknowledge what we know and what we don't know about the North Korean economy. Um, so this is actually not to deny that, you know, the situation is, is, um, is difficult, but just to say that we don't, Nobody really knows exactly how difficult the situation is. Um, that said, I think the relationship with Russia um, and its impact or potential impact on the North Korean people's livelihood, I don't think that that's going to have a, a visible, visibly, um, visibly um, significant or um, yeah, significant okay. impact, um, not in the short term. We know that North Korea is importing wheat, um, crude oil, um, you know, refined petroleum uh, products. Um, I think it will take a while before any of that actually has a, starts to have an impact on um, everyday people's um, livelihood. Um, for sure, I think with um, what they're importing, you know, the oil. Um, and petroleum from Russia, you know, it'll get things going, moving along, you know, on the, you know, in terms of operating factories, for example, or on the agricultural front. Um, but um, it's, it's, um, it's, it takes a lot to turn the economy around. Uh, we're talking about in order to improve the economy to a point where it can actually have a direct impact on the, um, on your ordinary people. Um, there has to be some fundamental change. And whether Russia is going to be a positive influence on North Korea in terms of inducing that positive change, I am skeptical. I mean, you know, Russia is not exactly known for its market economy, like vibrant market economy. Sure. Um, so, you know, positive influence, not really. I think it... Um, again, poses or provides or offers more options for Kim Jong-un. That said, whether those options are stopgap measures 
um, or whether Kim Jong-un is going to use those opportunities to fundamentally turn its economy around so that it does have a positive impact on the people. Um, that, I think, is left to be seen. My worry is that because Kim Jong-un sees some, he has more breathing space, right? Um, because of his blossoming, the, the blossoming relationship with Russia. I think this is only going to, going to confirm for Kim Jong-un and his associates that what they are doing with the economy, their economic policy, um, is something that they can maintain. Um, and the economic policy that we're talking about right now um, is not one that we want to see. So it's not, it, it's, they're talking about greater central control, uh, which goes against the essence of, of reform um, and the essence of Kim Jong-un's reform measures um, is, uh, is decentralization, you know, giving more responsibility to lower level units, um, to individuals. So centralization goes against that, um, against that tenor. Um, so, you know, when you have, again, um, you know, when, when if, if Kim Jong-un sees Russia um, as a lifeline, at least for the near term, he has really no incentive um, to change what he's doing. I think it's, it, in fact, um, I worry that it's just going to confirm for him that he can just keep, um, just, just keep on this track. Um, that, that he's currently on. I want to pull on some some things you were talking about uh, with, you know, a trading relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, we spoke earlier in the, in, the, in, in the show about military trade, but there are other resources that are of value to both sides. Could you, what, what would you see as those resources which would be of, of interest uh, that, that, that could, could it, expand this relationship. I mean, articles 10 and 11 there talk about this economic, uh, of, of the treaty talk about mm. doing this, going in this direction. Well, um, so it's really hard to see how Russia's investment would actually come to fruition because there have been attempts made in the past uh, where they, the two countries talked about investment, you know, greater economic cooperation, but nothing really came out of those various talks right. and discussions, like the North Korea-Russia uh, treaty uh, signed in July 2021 when Putin visited um, Pyongyang, um, that treaty also contained language about economic cooperation, but you know nothing really came out of it. Um, but I, I mean, of course, the situation now is vastly different from 2001, and I think for both sides, uh, there's more, um, there's going to be more incentive um, for them to. Um, to forge a stronger um, or try to forge a stronger economic relationship. But it's if we go back by if we go by past, you know, like past precedent, um, it's it's it raises questions about the the actual feas feasibility of um, of of what what they're alluding to um, in the in in articles um, in the two articles, um, Article 10 and 11. 11 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, in terms of what they have and, you know, uh, North Korea has what Ru has what Russia wants and Russia has what North Korea wants. And, you know, we talked about some of this, you know, North Korea has weapons that Russia needs. Um, you know, it has uh, manpower that it can export. Um, you know, Russia can provide uh, North Korea with, again, wheat, crude, oil, petroleum, refined petroleum. Um so it's, but beyond that, it would be, you know, we, we talk about, uh, we hear about North Korean uh, or Russian tourists um, visiting yeah. um, Pyongyang. I am not sure how many Russians would actually continue to visit North Korea. Um, to it, and, and if so, is that number going to be enough to revive North Korea's tourism industry? Uh, we know that North Korea, Kim Jong Un is um, investing in tourism right now. You know, just just a few weeks ago, he visited, um, you know, Wonsan, and he they want to um, open it up uh, for tourists um, sometime next year, I believe. Um, but again, is that going to be is um, is Russian demand going to be enough? 
Um, and again, I think these are questions that um, that that are left to be seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of built up this tension now, this proverbial guns over butter. Um, <laughs> and this is important. Um, choices have to be made. Decisions have to be uh, weighed. Uh, so how does this relationship with North Korea, Russia and North Korea, I mean, how does it provide this, this trade-off? Uh, and what will that mean then between military spending and the welfare of the citizens? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a very important question. Um, I think, so some people, um, North Korea seems to think that, um, and it has, well, it, it has argued in the past and it is, it is doing so now, hmm. um, that investing in the munitions and defense industries will ultimately benefit the people because investing in those two industries will eventually improve the civilian, civilian economy. So um, the logic that North Korea has traditionally used was um, that, okay, when we improve the defense and the munitions industries, um, you know, there, there are spillover effects because every all the industries are interconnected, right? So like heavy industries, for example, um, you know, we're talking about metal, chemical, right? Um, machinery. So those are all key industries in North Korea. That's right. Right? And, but at the, and, and at the same time, those heavy industries are critical for munitions and defense, right? The, the, those two industries. Yeah. So North Korea's logic has always been when it wanted to invest more in defense and munitions was, well, you know, look at what, look at, look at the heavy industries, right? We invest in heavy industries and they'll, you know, feed into the defense, you know, and munitions uh, industries. And in turn, everybody's happy because yeah. those will ultimately benefit the civilian economy. So their thinking is, uh, we revive the munitions and defense industries, the civilian um, economy blossoms in the end. I mean, to give you an example, the Kimchek uh, steel mill probably employs 50,000 people. It is a massive, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, employer of, of people. Mm -hmm. And if you're, whatever you're pumping out of that steel mill is, uh, is putting people at work. So to your point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's how they portray it. Yeah. Um, so, but then my, you know, common sense though, would dictate that every country has limited resources, right? Oh, of course. Um, yeah. Every country, oh, not just North Korea, yeah. right? Every country. So, the more you spend on defense, the less you, the less you spend on the civilian, on the civilian economy. Um, and, you know, for North Korea, especially, it's important, you know, like where that money goes, because, um, you know, the, the less you spend on the civilian economic sectors, the, the, the less likelihood there is of, you know, these, uh, you know, what we call market oriented measures yes. that Kim Jong-un implemented at the outset of, the, uh, of his rule. You know the the less likelihood of those market oriented measures uh, to to actually take root and blossom. Yeah. Um, you know, North Korea has, you know, even when they were shooting off missiles and you know conducting yeah. nuclear tests, you know, the Pyongyan during the Pyongyan years between two thousand thirteen and two thousand, um, you know, April two thousand eighteen. Um, you know, they had the Pyongyan policy, which is parallel development of nuclear forces and um, the economy. But you know the civilian economy always took a back seat, yes. um, and 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 now there's a you know there's some discussion about whether North Korea's you know has returned to Pyongyang. I think it's at least Pyongyang, if not more. <laughs> um, but North Korea never officially uh, went back to Pyongyang. Yeah, you know um, there's officially stay still in that. Um, there's still that that policy of all efforts on the economy. That policy is still um, has not been rolled back. Yeah. Um, but um, it's Pyongyang um, and uh, Pyongyang, if not more than Pyongyang. I mean, I think that's North Korea has decided that the best way for now to revive the economy is by revitalizing the munitions and the defense yeah. industries. And I think we see that playing out in the media. You know, if you look at um, the concentration of uh, Kim Jong Un's public appearances, you know, and and he's made a lot of appearances um, in the munitions 
uh, factories, uh, the defense uh, institutes, um, you know, the enterprises run by, you know, the defense, uh, the um, the academy of um, military or defense uh, science. Um, it's very much military and defense industry focused, um, which is an irony because uh, we hear about the 20 by 10 policy um, in North Korean media a lot, which is why, you know, it's it, it kind of seems like Pyongyang, right, where you have parallel development of the civilian economy. The 20 by 10 policy is a civilian economic project. Right. That would be uh, one industry mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in every county, in 10 counties for 20 years. Is that right? Um, guess, building... 20 20 counties for 10 years. Right. Building um, industrial factories in uh, 20 counties for or cities um, over the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, launched earlier this year. But again, you know, it's an irony because, you know, they, they talk about it a lot, like every day. You know, it's got it has like a very prominent um, media coverage in, in North Korea. But, um, you know, if you think about if you look at where Kim Jong-un is going, um, a lot more appearances, yeah. um, military um, and defense uh, munitions. Yeah. In the interest of time, I want to move yes, to. Uh, let me ask you this: uh, What are you? What's your predictions for the uh, future outlook for uh, where this goes? Uh, Long-term economic outcomes for North Korea. Um, I think North Korea is still struggling to find the right balance between uh, market-oriented measures and control. And I think it will continue to be in that mode. Um, and I think Russia improved relations with Russia. We don't know how long, um, you know, this tension between North Korea and China will last. But um, assuming that it doesn't last, it's not a strategic change on North Korea's part. Um, you know, they'll, the relationship will improve. Yeah. Um, and if so, like even more options for Kim Jong-un, right? Um, better relationship with um, Russia and, and, and also with, with China. Um, and that means less motivation to improve relations with the US. And because of you know, the, the correlation between North Korea's foreign policy and North Korea's economic policy, um, I think when we see that pivot towards Russia and China and 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 pulling back from the U.S. It doesn't bode well um, for the North Korean economy. And I think um, one other thing that I would like to add is that you know we have to assume that North Korea is learning a lot of lessons yes. from Russia's war in Ukraine and how the Russians have managed to actually grow the economy uh, during the war. And I think that's a major learn, uh, lesson learned for Kim Jong-un. And I think, I wonder if he thinks that he can build some form of wartime economy the way that Russia has. You know, and again, this goes back to my point earlier about revitalizing the defense and munitions industries. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we could have another hour's discussion on that. And it would be fascinating to me. We are... Um, we had well over 100 uh, registered for the program, and we had lots of questions. And so let's go for a bit of a lightning round, okay. and let's do some of these questions. First one about regional security. Mm -hmm. What impact will the North Korea-Russia alliance have on the Asia-Pacific Asia -Pacific security? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the treaty mm -hmm. uh, opens uh, certainly opens um, more, uh, more um, space for Russia to become involved um, in the region. So I think that um, increases the uncertainties um, in the region. Okay. Trilateral partnership. Is North Korea aiming to establish and lead a new trilateral partnership with China and Russia? And what could this mean for regional dynamics? I don't, I personally don't think that North Korea, I think that North Korea would like to forge um, something similar to what um, the U.S. and the ROK in Japan have, right? The security um, cooperation. Um, but I think it also understands that China is reluctant and will probably continue to be reluctant, you know, in terms of being pulled into that dynamic, right? Of um, the dynamic here referring to China, Russia, and North Korea. Um, so I don't think that they will aspire to that. I think 
they would like to, but I think they're, um, they probably understand that that's not going to be likely. Um, however, speaking of um, alliances and arrangements, arrang trilateral arrangements, I think that they would be very glad to join um, as an active player um, any block formation um, attempt by Russia. Uh, not as a passive participant, but as an active participant, probably seeing itself even as a key player. Mm. Interesting. And, and and for that reason, I think um, their burgeoning relationship with the Belarusians is something to keep an eye on. Okay. Regime stability. How does the partnership with Russia influence North Korea's domestic political landscape, particularly regarding regime stability? Uh, I think it's it will be have a positive impact, you know, in terms of regime security, because again, I have to go back to my point earlier about the various options that even more options that Kim Jong-un now has. Um, the breathing space that um, this improved relationship with, with Russia um, provides, for example, the wheat, the, the oil, petroleum um, that it wasn't getting before. China's influence is the next question. How could this partnership challenge China's influence over North Korea? And what are the potential economic consequences if there is a rivalry there? Mm. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think that China has too much influence on North Korea right now. Um, whether how long this lasts, we don't know. Um, I have a feeling that Kim Jong-un feels like he can go back to China mm -hmm. at any point if he, when he feels like it. You know, it's like a relationship that's kind of like always there that he can just go back to. That's, that's how I, that's how I see, you know, um, Kim Jong-un thinking about, um, you know, his relationship with China because, you know, we also, we often times focus so much on China's leverage or influence over North Korea, but you know we don't think about, you know, the fact that China needs North Korea's stability. It does, it right? Of its, it's fourteen uh, neighboring states, and it does not want instability on the, any part of it. It's the status quo, yeah. you know. I mean, North China just has to shut off the um, the the oil pipeline <laughs> into North Korea, but it doesn't. It hasn't, yeah. right? Even 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 when the relationship was at their at its worst. So we know that Kim Jong-un knows this. Yes. Um, and that's North Korea's leverage over China. Um, so, so in that sense, I think um, North Korea knows that it probably can go back to China um, at any point. Um, but in terms of um, the economic relationship, again, 98.3% is hard to, yeah, hard to replace yeah. um, you know, from yeah. any country's point of view. Economic policy shifts. Could the economic cooperation between North Korea and Russia lead to significant shifts in North Korea's economic policies and its practices? You talked a little bit about that. Would you say any more? Um, I think it's it, it doesn't bode well for for uh, North Korea's reform policies. I think um, you know because of the confidence that Kim Jong Un has gained um, domestically. You know, um, it claims to have um, improved the economy in twenty twenty three. Um, and uh, it survived the international sanctions, the self-isolation. So I think the self-confidence that Kim Jong-un has gained from, from those developments domestically and also um, the confidence he has gained from his summits with Putin, um, the improving relationship with Russia, will um, likely keep Kim Jong-un on this path um, that he's currently on, which is not toward reform, but away from reform. Okay. There are more questions we could ask, but we're going to have to leave it at that. I always like to ask the guests, though, to uh, give us a book recommendation. And so what would you what would you recommend? Well, we talked about North Korea's foreign policy and the drivers of North Korea foreign policy a lot um, during this uh, session. So uh, in that vein, uh, the book that I would like to recommend is um, North Korea's foreign policy, uh, the Kim Jong-un regime in a hostile world. Uh, written by multiple um, authors, um, but edited by the great Scott Snyder, yes. <laughs> the head of the right. KEI, mm -hmm. and um, Professor uh, Kyung-A Park yes. uh, from the University of Vancouver, um, and um, some really great um, articles, um, basically talking about the drivers of uh, North Korea foreign policy 
uh, domestic um, drivers that we don't always talk about too much. So very insightful. This has been a very fast hour for me. Uh, I have greatly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for accepting the offer to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. As we conclude, understanding the North Korea-Russia alliance requires appreciating both the strategic motivations and the realities of global power dynamics. By recognizing the interplay between these complex factors, we can better consider the challenges and opportunities that drive this relationship. Now, I encourage you to join us on September 9th for our next Security Nexus webinar, Shared Waters, Shared Futures, Cooperative Approaches to Water Security in the Indo-Pacific with Dr. Ethan Allen. Amidst growing water crisis in the Indo-Pacific, this session will explore the urgent need for innovative strategies, technological advancements, and international cooperation to secure this vital resource for future generations. From all of us at the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii, thank you for being a part of this important conversation. I'm James Minnick, and until we meet again, aloha oi. As always, the opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of DKI APCSS, the U.S. Department of Defense, or the U.S. government.